Good evening. Welcome to our global trade and uh, global trade and political economy, Economics 330, City University of New York, Medgarivers College. Today is uh, Tuesday, November 5th, aka Election Day. And uh, this begins the uh, lecture period of our office hours slash lecture day. Um, we have, we, it's now 6.07 and it's long past our five minutes, five minute grace period. Um, so between last week and this week, we have co uh, covers, covered thus far international monetary relations and global trade relations. As we continue in this week, our second of three segments will discuss theories of trade, the evolution of multilateral and bilateral trade agreements. Special attention would also be given to regional trade agreements. Finally, we will discuss trade regimes and how they affect relations between nations and groups within a country. Trade can be a contentious issue, as I hope we're all beginning to realize, because interest groups and the broader public view their welfare as being affected by trade than by monetary investment or financial policy. Thus, business, labor, agriculture, consumer, environmental, and cultural groups try to influence government trade policies. The forces of globalization also continue to have a major effect on trade relations. Consider, for instance, that from 1950 to 1973, world economic output, or GDP, grew at an average annual rate of 5.1%, while trade increased on average by 8.2%. From 1974 to 2007, the figures were 2.9% for GDP growth and 5.0% for, for trade growth. The growing interdependence of states has also made trade relations more vulnerable to economic downturns. So let me really unpack very quickly what the data that I just cited appear to suggest. It suggests that while trade volumes have grown, GDP growth has not kept pace with trade volume. What this appeared to suggest is that it could lead to populations not linking increased global trade to prosperity, as incorrect as that assumption might be. Thus, the 20, 2008 financial, global financial crisis precipitated drop in global production and trade first in the developed economies, then in developing countries. This is what they call the contagion. Recall that in, in a previous class some weeks ago, I in, introduced the phrase economic contagion. More recently, last week actually, last week's lecture included why in effort to promote their exports, many countries engage in the competitive undervaluation of their currencies. As you will recall, my lecture included the definition, advantages and disadvantages of fixed exchange rate, also known as the gold standard. We also discussed floating exchange rates, and we also discussed pegged exchange rate system, which incorporates aspects of floating and fixed rate systems. We also discussed how exchange rate regimes can affect the balance of payment of countries. It should be noted, however, that the practice of adopting non-market measures to manipulate currency valuation can raise the possibility of a trade war. Indeed, your reading assignment for this week include tariffs and counter tariffs between the US and Chinese governments, especially during the Trump administration. Furthermore, note that the trade and foreign investments are closely related. Multinational corporations also have considerable influence on trade issues. 
and intra-firm trade within multinational corporations account for one-third of total world trade. So as we continue with this second week of the three segments, we will discuss the theories of trade, the evolution of multilateral and bilateral trade agreements. Special attention will be given to regional trade agreements as well as. And finally, we will discuss trade regimes and how they affect relations between nations and groups within a country. So here are your learning objectives for this week. At the conclusion of this week, you will be able to do the following. First, explain multilateral trade relations during the last two centuries. And here is how I would phrase this. Before I begin, it is important to understand the connection between these learning objectives and the learning outcomes for the end of this semester, for the end of this week. So when you master these learning objectives, you would have acquired the knowledge for the learning outcomes. So the first learning objective is to explain multilateral trade relations during the last two centuries, to which I would say, from the Silk Road to today's Belt and Road Initiative, from North American Free Trade Agreement, NAFTA, to the United States-Mexico-Canada Agreement, USMCA, from the creation of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade to the birth of the WTO. Trade has played an important role in supporting economic development and peaceful relations among nations. Two, describe the evolution of international trade organizations such as the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, the WTO, which is the World Trade Organization, and regional trade agreements, to which I would suggest that as we discussed in previous lectures, the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, aka GATT, evolved into the World Trade Organization, aka WTO, to include trade in services and intellectual property protection. While regional trade associations such as USMCA, ASEAN, the European Union has forged free trade zones to common markets that create economic inter interdependencies and as a result, this incentivizes conflict. Three, explain why trade among nations is potentially advantageous to all trading partners. All things being equal, trade among nations is, is advantageous to all trading partners because leveraging the comparative advantage of each country enhances the efficiency of global supply chains. So countries will make the things that they're best, they're able to make most com price competitive that they have otherwise would have, are said to have a comparative advantage. This allows countries to grow their economy through the sale of goods and services where it has comparative advantage while still being able to enjoy the goods it imports from trading partner countries with comparative advantage in the imported goods and or services. Let me quickly add that the technical terminologies for this week, and again, as I said in previous classes, there are phrases and words that you might want to make note of that are really technical phrases that suggest a technical understanding of the subject matter of global trade and political economy. And one of them is absolute advantage. Another is comparative, comparative advantage. And the third is opportunity cost. So let me also remind you that our word of the week and technical phrases and terminologies signal your strength, as I said, uh, your technical subject matter knowledge to the audience. So let's now uh, transition quickly to the meanings of these three phrases. Absolute advantage refers to the ability 
of a country or an entity to more efficiently produce a greater quantity of goods or services than the competition. The theory of absolute advantage dates back to Adam Smith, an 18th century, who I'm sure many of you covered in your paper and most some of your weekly assessments, an 18th century Scottish economist and philosopher who was a pioneer in the field of political economy. In Smith's seminal economics book, The Wealth of Nations, he theorized that countries should focus on goods that they can produce efficiently and should use trade as a way to acquire anything they are not able to make themselves. Comparative advantage, on the other hand, refers to the ability of a country or an entity to produce goods and services at a lower opportunity cost compared to the competition. So that means that if country A and country B can make flip-flops, the assumption here is that flip-flops is an inferior, inexpensive good. And country A can also make computer chips. And country A can only choose to make, up a, uh, make computer chips or flip-flops. That it may be better for company A to forego making flip-flops and going to making computer chips because it's what it's considered a value-added good. It's more expensive. You're going to sell it for more money. You're going to pay your staff more wages, higher wages, and your staff is, all things being equal, going to be more skilled. So if country A chooses instead to make flip-flops instead of computer chips, which it has the capacity to make, unlike country B, Country B, country A, would not be maximizing its endowment because the opportunity cost of making that flip-flops is too high. Is the money that they would have made, the higher wages that they would have, they, the lockers would have earned, and the higher skills that this labor force would have had. Those are all opportunity costs that is lost by manufacturing flip-flop. So comparative advantage would argue that country A should instead focus on making computer chips and allow country B to make flip-flops. And then country B will buy that computer chips from com country A, while country A buys that flip-flop from country B. So that is the logic behind comparative advantage relative to absolute advantage. The third is opportunity costs, which refers to what you have to give up to buy what you want in terms of other goods or services. When economists use the word cost, we usually mean opportunity cost. So again, what I mean by that, to, to make it a lot easier rather than the, the explanation about manufacturing. If you have $10 and you want ice cream, but you also want a bottle of juice and each costs $10, but you only have $10. And you instead choose to buy ice cream. The cost of that ice cream is $10. But the opportunity cost for that ice, ice cream is $10 plus a bottle of juice because that's what you had to give up. These are the two items that you had to give up to get that ice cream. You had to give up $10, which you paid, and then you have to give up the, an opportunity to buy juice. So that's the difference between cost and opportunity cost. Cost, of course, is just simply the $10. But because in life, we always have to make choices. The choice you made is to pay $10 and give up the opportunity to buy juice. So remember, the world decides what you are by what you show it. That is really important. So wear your scholarship on your sleeve and uh, use these key phrases. And when you go through today's, this week's lecture, which I've just, uh, we just got, had an overview of, here are the learning outcomes that you should be able to master. You should be able to distinguish and contrast between the general agreement on tariffs and trade and the World Trade Organization. 
you should be able to explain the role of North American trade agreement. You should be able to describe and explain the role of other regional trade agreements, such as the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, SCN, and the Caribbean Community, aka CARICOM. And four, you should be able to describe and apply theories of trade, such as comparative advantage. So before I open the floor to questions, let me congratulate the class on completing and being on our way to completing module nine. And of course, I hope those of us who are able to vote have indeed voted and exercised our civic uh, duties. Thank you very much. And uh, I would uh, end the recording and start the Q&A session.